Great. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Rosalie. And am I audible in the back? It's okay. Okay. Uh, terrific. It's, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here at the Architectural League and to see so many friends from California and the Great Lakes region as well as New York here and, uh, and to then launch into this really, I think, uh, uh, compelling uh, program that the uh, Architectural League has uh, uh, launched on the 5,000 pound life and the uh, particular role that uh, water will play uh, in this. And so my title is Climate, Energy, and Water Conserving uh, Design. Um, our charge from uh, 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 Rosalie was to focus on the aspects in the context of water uh, resources management in the context of climate change and uh, energy uh, usage and int intensity. And so I begin with these two very familiar diagrams of the world the global energy budget as modified by human action and the uh, uh, hyd hydrologic cycle. Um, within these kind of connection between, uh, call it energy and uh, uh, hy hydrologic processes uh, that in which climate processes key play a key role, um, we also have uh, three emphases. Um, in the domain of climate change, the emphasis on mitigation, as Rosalie mentioned, as compared with adaptation. And I'm really so glad that the League is pressing mitigation because it's very easy to kind of uh, let go in some ways and say adaptation is really the imperative. Um, the mitigation is such a formidable challenge uh, and society's probability of addressing it effectively um, less probable than some of the adaptation alternatives that uh, are going to have to be engaged that, but here the uh, attitude is just the opposite. Let's get to the root causes of these problems. So mitigation uh, is one key theme. The second on the uh, energy intensity of water use. I'll say more about that in a minute. And then a, and a concept, perhaps the key concept I'd like to introduce through this uh, opening talk on the idea of water conserving design. And that's one that I'll spend the bulk of the time elaborating that I have this morning. So let's take the word design. And uh, Rosalie mentioned the multiple scales of design. Let, let's also talk, think about design inquiry as involving uh, different uh, spheres, uh, including, um, uh, I'll say, our own in the design fields of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design as a suite of uh, professions and allied professions uh, uh, that are, have design at the heart of uh, what we do. Uh, but let's think about engineering systems as also a domain of design, and then as, water, as policy design as well. And the integration of these three types of design thinking, design inquiry, will be crucial, I think, for forming up a uh, uh, effective approach to water conserving design in the context of climate change. We have three regions uh, that are part of our panels uh, this, uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, and these are in, uh, I'm gonna say uh, shorthand is Los Angeles, Great Lakes, uh, New York City, and uh, why not, let's add Boston, my hometown, and uh, have a, a little bit of uh, 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 breadth there, but as we'll see, in Boston is the simplest case, the simplest case. Uh, this is the Metropolitan Water Resources Authority's uh, uh, ma uh, map for its water supply system. And this doesn't include any of the kinds of wastewater treatment, harbor, uh, cleanup uh, jurisdictions, but it spans multiple jurisdictions, it spans multiple basins, and it has a geographic complexity that will be even orders of magnitude more complex in each of our three case study regions. So the geographical definition of the, uh, of the cases and the approaches taken within them is a huge challenge. Not only are they three independent cases, these cases have important interconnections among them. So I thought this would be a uh, interesting pair of diagrams to indicate that these cases are not entirely independent. Uh, in fact, on the left-hand side, you see a recent representation of virtual trade in agricultural commodities, virtual water trade in agricultural commodities by Megan Konar and, and colleagues at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then on the right-hand side, the virtual trade in the water and energy 
uh, nexus in which uh, the contributions of energy to the grid by different states or at, in different states are being transported, traded uh, to other regions where that energy is consumed. If you put the two diagrams together, it's interesting that on the uh, left-hand diagram, California is the, is the great exporter of virtual water in foodstuffs, and it's the great importer of virtual water in energy production. So you have a trade in water, food, and energy amongst all of the states uh, as, uh, that we'll be talking about and all of the regions that we're talking about that make these cases interdependent with one another as well as distinctive in their own terms. Uh, distinctive is a kind of a polite word for the urban water cycle. Here's a nice uh, diagram produced by UNESCO's urban water program on the urban water cycle. It's a cartoon, really, of all the kind of, call it horrors, of urban wa uh, water um, modification and uh, oh, uh, problems that we generate that then require design solutions to try to mitigate, um, both in the root causes, but then also in the consequences of their, uh, uh, of these, of these changes. So summarizing what I've just said in the past seven minutes, uh, we have three regions. Uh, in each of those regions, there's been a main association with supply, quality, and um, call it flooding um, and hazards. So three regions three problems, three resource domains, water, energy, climate, three emphases within those domains, three types of design that I've mentioned. So we make these a combinatorial type of process and you can see that we have more variables than cases, which means that you have to have a pro an approach which is not trying to generalize across cases, but really trying to open up problem and get a sense of the range of possibilities. If we think of this as the varieties of water eh, uh, conserving design, that would perhaps be one of the best approaches to think about this uh, six hours that we have ahead of us. Um, not generalization, but uh, exploration. And exploration in a systematic and hopefully well-structured kind of uh, a uh, set of either types of problems and types of solutions uh, that uh, help us uh, imagine this field uh, in new and broader uh, ways, from which one might move towards another conference that would be seeking to generalize across a larger number of cases and get to uh, some insights about the uh, uh, what works and what doesn't, what has promise and what, what less so. So just to take the three concepts, because each one of them, uh, uh, I imagine in our group here that some will be more fami familiar with the fields of climate change mitigation, others with energy use intensity, and still others with the water field. And so I thought, well, th this opening talk might be useful if it introduces the three concepts and helps uh, set the stage for more detailed discussion that follows. So. Uh, the diagrams associated with the three concepts below is an IPCC document on showing mitigation measures as compared with adaptation. Uh, the central diagram is representing some energy use variables in a spider diagram. We'll talk about a bit more about that in a moment. And then this idea of water conserving design, which is my special interest. So first, uh, mitigation. And the whole concept, what does mitigation mean? Well, let's go back in history and look at some early uses of this word, uh, mitigation. Um, and they uh, uh, range from an obsolete biblical passage on compassion and mercy. I don't think that's quite what the connotations are today, but it's not irrelevant. Uh, the more uh, familiar uh, idea of abatement of damage or loss from a wrongful act, pretty much on target as of the start of the 15th century. Pretty much have this concept very clear. As we move through, though, the different historical uses of the term mitigation, there's a close approximation with the mitigation of certain diseases like respiratory diseases and bioclimatic therapy of 
uh, settlement design and, and building design, particularly in uh, kind of more semi-arid, arid parts of the, uh, uh, the country that were very important in this type of, of, of movement, migration, and therapies uh, that were uh, environmentally based. But I think the more significant point is that in the Oxford English Dictionary, there is as yet no reference to climate change mitigation no reference even to natural ha or environmental hazards mitigation as a phrase in, in that key. And so this tells us that there, this concept of climate change mitigation hasn't yet permeated at least this extraordinary record of English language usage. That doesn't mean that it's not uh, getting extraordinary recognition uh, in uh, the fields of science and policy and which if we look at a plot of the publication on climate change mitigation uh, over the past couple of decades, we see a few references, 1980s. Uh, this is coming in as a, as a concept that mitigation of climate change is, is, is key. The Montreal Protocol for the ozone um, reduction was a pivotal event, but even more so the Kyoto Protocol uh, leading up to the point where, oh, in the recent years, you have almost a 1,000 publications per year on climate change mitigation. Now, that's a lot to comprehend and digest. It's a specialized field in its own right, and I think we can kind of get a good perspective on it. Those who really want to dig more, under, uh, kind of know more about the field of climate change mitigation, there are a number of synthesis documents you would find, I think, useful. This first one of the IPCC special volume on uh, climate change mitigation published a year ago is, is useful uh, both as a summary of the field, but then in addition for how it uh, breaks up the uh, 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 sources of greenhouse gas emissions and the significance of our design fields in helping to both create the problems presently and mitigate them in the future. I don't have a pointer, I don't think, but if you just look at the uh, uh, left hand uh, circle, which is giving a uh, estimate of the different sources of emissions. The largest category is the blonde. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, we're just mastering the button down. Okay, terrific. Okay, so these blonde uh, portions are the uh, emissions that are generated uh, for uh, electricity and heat production. For direct emissions, uh, that's going to be the, 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 the largest category. And then secondarily, uh, this green is the agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. That is human modified uh, land uses that uh, would um, uh, occur in the, in the fields of agriculture, forestry, involve deforestation, afforestation, and cultivation techniques that contribute to or mitigate um, emissions. Indirectly, if one then takes the uh, blonde portion of the diagram here uh, the, for electricity and heat production and breaks that out into the larger sources, you'll see that buildings are the largest category of emissions uh, that are emanating indirectly uh, or that uh, generate indirectly uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So our fields of uh, environmental design, uh, whether it's the architectural fields, uh, the landscape architecture and planning fields are and associated energy uh, uh, engineering and planning fields are, are, are really uh, absolutely central uh, to the uh, uh, goal of mitigation. Let's look at the relationship between energy uh, and water use, and particularly this idea of energy intensity. The diagram on the right is a representation of some of what's called sometimes the energy water nexus of different types of connections between whether it's the generation of energy through uh, hydropower or uh, more largely, as we've been talking about up till now, the types of power production that uh, um, uh, are uh, kind of using water to then often pump water to from a place of supply to a place of use. Uh, this is just a simple cartoon of these relationships. Uh, but energy uh, use intensity is the amount of energy that's used to accomplish a given end or produce a, a certain product. So 
At the bottom of this list on the uh, uh, left-hand side, you'll see that the energy intensity of water use um, for water supply it might be measured in kilowatt hours per million gallons of water per day. That is to collect, to store, to convey, to pump, to, uh, and then ultimately to treat, um, to collect wastewater, treat it, and discharge it in uh, appropriate ways. Um, the aggregate usage of energy and water in the water sector is huge. The Pacific Institute has developed a very, what they call a simple method for looking at the energy and carbon intensity of water use. So let's take uh, their simple matrix, and this is like, so let's say you have a water utility, in, or one of our three cases, in the Boston case, it might be the Metropolitan Water Resources Authority. Describe the type of supply, the types of energy that are consumed uh, in that system. And one can then start to uh, estimate, okay, we have so many kilowatt hours per million gallons of water that are uh, produced in supply terms. We can also look at the ways in which uh, the CO2 emissions uh, are generated as a uh, function of that um, energy intensity of water use. And from this, uh, t this uh, uh, simple uh, matrix, call it, uh, you see that you can address this problem by driving down any one of three variables. You either drive down use and water demand on the rows, you drive down the energy intensity uh, of water use, fewer kilowatt hours per amount of water supplied, or you drive down the carbon intensity. They're not linearly related to one another. These are all separate modes of intervention. They're linked, but they actually also, we'll see, have some variability in how one can address them. I'll just give a, a little bit of a taste of what will be elaborated, I think, in some of the presentations later, that this ways of mitigating the carbon intensity of the energy intensity of the water use, um, at least a, a, a few major categories that have come to mind, blue-green infrastructure in urban design, fundamental importance, particularly for land use, land cover types of dynamics, their effect on heat island effect, uh, uh, and uh, other energy exchange at the Earth's surface, as well as emissions. Um, can't uh, uh, underestimate the importance of decision support systems, SCADA systems, new sensor technologies that help to get unbelievably more sophisticated controls than we've ever had in these complex water systems. And then to say, how do we kind of combine those, call it high technology, with community-based mitigation movements and approaches that are profoundly important for both discovering uh, uh, some innovations and also for generating policies that uh, 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 come from the people as compared with being uh, directed towards the people. Okay, this is kind of setting the stage for the concepts of water use, water use intensity, water use efficiency, which is a related term. We speak of energy intensity as the amount of energy used to accomplish some purpose. Same thing can be said about water use efficiency. And here's a diagram that shows three key concepts of water use efficiency. You'll hear some concepts in which you're trying to really increase the efficiency of water use. In irrigation systems, this is a key concept. You want to have a, a, a high efficiency is a good thing. 90% of your irrigation water, that it's evapotranspired effectively by the, uh, the plants uh, as compared with uh, the water withdrawn from a surface uh, water supply or groundwater uh, aquifer is uh, a movement to go from a kind of average 50% up towards much more uh, uh, efficient uh, systems in hydrologic terms, one type of uh, way of thinking of water use efficiency. Second would be to say, well, actually, let's not just look at the hydrologic portion. Let's look at the actual what's produced. So this might be bushels per day if it's crops. It might be uh, other types of products uh, that are coming out of the use of water. And uh, that'd be a second way of a metric uh, for water use efficiency. Third way of thinking about water use efficiency would just say, well, what's the value of what's produced? You know, and that might be estimated in uh, 
dollar terms. It might be estimated in terms of other uh, uh, ways of eliciting um, the social values associated with uh, water use or water that's sometimes called non-use. Leaving water in a stream also has uh, use value for societies and uh, you can say that in ecosystem services terms or you can actually me measure it in other societal uh, ways of eliciting uh, preferences and, and values. These three uh, metrics for water use efficiency can be helpful for doing these kinds of analysis, but it's important at the end of the day to recognize that efficiency isn't the only thing that we're thinking about with good design uh, for uh, uh, cities and, and, and regions. And so let's expand this concept of water use efficiency. It's a crucial concept, but let's uh, really expand it into a broader perspective. And, and my way of thinking about this has been influenced not by working in a, a cities in the US, but actually working in, 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 in projects in India. And the first project that got me involved in this was actually the excavation and conservation of gardens uh, as part of the Taj Mahal complex uh, in Agra, where we had to think about the, the conservation of wa the water systems in that complex and also the water resources associated with it. So when an archaeologist will think about conserving uh, water, a water system, frequently it's the physical waterworks. And so on the upper left-hand side, you'll see uh, a, a brilliant lotus pit where in a very shallow pool in a semi-arid area, you create a small pit and you can grow this luxuriant plant and give a tropical effect, but with a very small uh, level of consumption. We have all, all kinds of innovations in soil stratification from, this is the, really the Mughal Rajput period, 15th through 18th centuries. So waterworks conservation would be the first category of what I'll call water conserving design. In kind of modern engineering uh, uh, terms, that would be maybe infrastructure management. It would also sometimes be called asset management. For the, how many civil engineers do we have in the field? AWWA members, okay, asset management and inf infrastructure, physical systems management, central to what one does. The second uh, uh, field of water conserving design is in the water resources uh, uh, themselves. And for that, some water budget diagrams, and I'll give a, uh, talk a little bit more about water budget analysis uh, in a moment, but this is actually conserving the water used itself relative to the water that's withdrawn from some source. And that will be uh, something I've just spoken about with water use efficiency, but it's crucial even for these historical systems to uh, think about how one conserves the water of conserved systems and restored historical systems. Thirdly, it, it's crucial to appreciate the experience of water in the most fundamental, I'll call it human and cultural ways. And this is where the humanities, I think, make a huge contribution to the field of water conserving design. When we think about the experience and meaning of water, and in the context where I'm working here, this is a Rajasthan project uh, uh, where it, if you want to understand the experience of water in historical terms, there's no better source than painting in this context. So painting is really the way to gain insight into how water was experienced and, and, and how profoundly important it was. The fourth topic is the actual livelihoods associated with water. You know, what are the water-related livelihoods? Whose livelihoods depend upon water? I'm going to be thinking in, in, in terms of animals and plants as well as humans. But these uh, livelihoods and really uh, being concerned about the quality of life in political and economic terms is a crucial dimension of water-conserving design. When we put them all together in this larger sphere, what, what does one have at the uh, kind of as integrative? Well, I'm just going to say this is what our three case studies, I'll, I'll punt on this and give it to our three case studies to tell us that water conserving design in a, in a complex region is going to be doing all of these things and it's going to try to do them in integrative ways. And then, and you say, whenever you see a Venn diagram, the key thing to ask is what's in the middle? It's rarely specified, but what's at the 
intersection of all of these activities and it, who's surprised that someone would be like would say well it's design this is what a designer does you know it's bring together from all of these sources a uh, the types of range of possibilities that societies and their places might find inspiring and uh, helpful in addressing their most profound problems. Let's uh, take a look at some specifics. I'm going to uh, say here, how do we use this kind of conceptual model? And I'll take this example from Rajasthan again to say, here's a hyper-arid region in which many people do not have a water, enough water to drink. And if you're saying, how does one restore a garden in such a complex, you have to be very serious about having the minimizing water use and maximizing the type of value that that small plantings as in the bottom left would have uh, for in terms of their historical authenticity but as well as their uh, resource cons conservation. If one were to take that approach, this kind of jewel-like small micro garden uh, with high levels of control approach in design terms to the broader area of this complex and uh, create a larger irrigated environment of the sort that many want to do, then frequently what will happen is that uh, the uh, amount of water consumed will start to be uh, vast. And to put this in terms that the sponsors of this project would really appreciate, I said, if you can imagine irrigating this whole complex in a, uh, a way that might have been the case even in its historical terms, just imagine at the hottest time of year, about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 47, 48 centigrade, imagine that you have a, a line of tanker trucks, 20 deep per day, coming in water to tanker trucks to supply a garden that will not be visited by any tourists at that hot season of the year. It's, a, it's an extraordinary um, uh, use of water for limited benefit and value. And, and I, so far it's been persuasive to use these techniques of water budget analysis to try to uh, conserve water in creative ways and to use uh, scenarios of climate change to say, look, it's, it's, one has to not just use the current climate or historical climate, but anticipate future climates and also anticipate the energy requirements it's going to take to actually uh, 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 restore this or any other type of project. In this period of the 16th and 17th century, we're measuring energy use in terms of animal draft power and human labor to lift water. And so I've actually done a lot of estimation of the amount of calories required to lift water and convey it into uh, uh, this complex and distribute it uh, uh, for both domestic uh, use as well as irrigation. And the, uh, when you put it in those terms and you ask how much how many calories are the workers uh, receiving in food energy to do that expenditure of labor in caloric terms makes it very, very real at when the balance uh, doesn't match, and it doesn't. You look at the uh, amount of labor that's required to do a lot of physical work in construction projects in many parts of the world, the amount of calories spent is a greater than the caloric, the wages, the, the kind of caloric value of wages. So these kinds of uh, uh, analyses of water energy relationships make the types of pumping costs that we'll be talking about very real in terms of the impacts they have for societies and environments. Doesn't mean that there weren't all kinds of innovations and uh, in this case, uh, acts of good governance to say, let's clear out, let's maintain the systems uh, so that they function effectively and efficiently, as you see in this image from the Akbarnama 16th century painting of a tank desilting project. But there's something else, I think, that has a lot of potential in design terms, uh, both historical and contemporary, that I'd like to try, try out on you for a moment if I can, because this is the related to that sphere of water conserving design that's um, called water experience. Let's take a look at this image. 
It's a performance platform, the musical kind of and theatrical performance in the middle of a water tank. Now this uh, tank at many seasons of much of the, uh, the year in an arid environment is empty. During the monsoon it will fill and then it will periodically kind of draw down in terms of its uh, elevation and height. Now, how many people really l love this image of an empty tank and its volume? This is the best response I've ever gotten <laughs> to this question. It's only architects, landscape architects, spatial thinkers who have an appreciation of the volume and void as having as much potential beauty and certainly the seasonality of emptying and filling uh, that such uh, 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 spaces would have. But in many, many contexts, the answer has been no. We want the water. We want it full. We want fountains playing. We want it. And it's not good without it. And so if you're thinking as a designer, how does one work with that? You say, well, gosh, you know, what you should really see is all these trees transpirating in the background. That's the water in this, uh, this image. Uh, there's plenty of water, but it's not in the tank. Any event, that, I have not been very persuasive with that up till now. <laughs> but I think in design terms, if we can cultivate that in ourselves and uh, students, clients, and, and, and uh, larger uh, work, it would be great. Now let's take the same model and put it into the kind of context of climate change. I'll just use the uh, water budget diagrams on the right-hand side. Um, this is historical conditions, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, water budget diagram. How many people have actually construct water budget diagrams, part of your work? Only a couple. Well, how many architects? Well, a lot. Now, how many landscape architects? Some. How many urban designers? Good number. Urban planners? Civil engineers? If you have few, okay, great. So I don't know of any project where it's not beneficial to construct a water budget diagram to plot, to understand what you're working with uh, in the terms of the water supply and its, its timing and seasonality. It's a, it's a basic type of analysis. It plots only two variables, precipitation in, in, in this Northeast context, it's pretty uniform across this, the months of the year. But evapotranspiration, potential evapotranspiration, the amount the climate would demand if uh, there was a sufficient amount of water available uh, is going to spike in the summer months in this northern hemisphere and then drop off in the uh, winter months. We have a surplus of moisture in the uh, springtime and uh, we're drawing that down from the soil moisture column here and having a net deficit here and then we recharge the soil and have a discharge, uh, uh, excess of discharge of runoff in the late uh, fall. Also have a little bit of s uh, snow storage as you, uh, at the immediate moment as well. Um, if in the urbanization context we, we drop down the soil moisture storage, which this diagram does, it, it, it reduces the amount of moisture that's so stored in the soil. We see the deficit increases if we drop down the precipitation by 20 percent, uh, then the deficit starts to become significant. It's still larger. Uh, the surplus that we have in our region is compared with other regions, and let's just take a look at our three cases here. And uh, uh, Los Angeles in the upper left, whoo, look at this, it's not going to produce it locally. Uh, it's going to have to come from elsewhere. And we'll hear more about that. Uh, Chicago, uh, New York, and Detroit uh, all have uh, some variants, uh, with New York having uh, less in the way of the s snow storage. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the uh, we'll also add Toronto in here for our Canadian colleagues in just a second and say, how are we going to compare these three cases when they have really profoundly different hydroclimatological uh, hydro regimes? That's one question. Some related questions of comparing, comparing the three cases that are coming up will be that there's a, a real challenge uh, in looking at these three variables that are core to tonight's uh, uh, presentation. The first of these uh, plots uh, compares the water use per capita in uh, cubic meters per year. 
And uh, by this account, the Toronto folks have the highest. I have to look into why that's the case, but they, along with the uh, Scandinavian uh, cities, uh, tend to be pretty high. Los Angeles second, and uh, Great Lakes are the lowest uh, uh, per capita water use annually. We see a different distribution in energy use per capita uh, on an annual basis. It's a different profile, and this, the cities are all have the same alignment, not sorted by, but you can just see that the shape of the different cases in water, the energy that's going to be partly related to the production of water, and then the CO2 emissions, yet another, a third distribution, a little bit different, all reinforcing the point that we have three points of intervention, not one that's going to cascade uh, in a kind of uh, simple matter through the other sectors. When one has three cases that vary so much, uh, and in so many ways contextually, again, it's looking at the range of choice, the range of possibilities that they'll offer to us. When we want to look at comparison later and to generalize from the three cases, that's where I'll suggest that venturing out across different uh, cities in North America, but also worldwide, is going to be a crucial goal. And I think I'm coming up with just five minutes, uh, so we'll just wind up with this point on comparison of uh, water conserving design worldwide. I've taken a lot of my inspiration and ideas from uh, South Asian cities, uh, India and Pakistan, and then found that they're quite useful to bring into the North American context and vice versa, this exchange of ideas uh, between uh, our regions and other parts of the world. The data that I just showed you uh, on those six cities actually is coming from a database for 142 cities that John Fernandez and his Urban Metabolism Lab at MIT has been developing in this map. And if I plot out just the water use variable for these cities, Here's how they sort. Again, Toronto at the top, uh, Los Angeles, and then they are in rank order, uh, moving down with uh, Boston as the, the lowest uh, of the uh, water use uh, cities in this uh, sample of 142 cities. But what you see is that we're kind of clustered worldwide. And along with there's most of the cities that were included in this database from China are also in this, this range. But we have cities like Copenhagen, much lower water use per capita. Um, we also have, though, uh, the cities that I've been talking about here, which are uh, cities of South Asia, of Africa, and elsewhere, where some innovations in water conserving design, particularly take the example of rainwater harvesting. No place where this is more advanced than in India today. So we should be really taking lessons from Chennai and Bangalore and Delhi that are grappling with how you implement rainwater harvesting, um, as well as some other innovations. I'll give you just a, some imagery of these places to kind of support the point in the graph of, of places that I found unbelievably inspiring in the way that they uh, will manage water in urban areas. This is a new water conserving uh, uh, infrastructure project in a walled city of Lahore, Pakistan. The step well or bali of the sacred shrine of Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi. One of the most profound self-supplied wastewater uh, projects worldwide, Karachi, Pakistan. Wastewater treatment of similar technologies that we have in North America in the case of Agra, but linked with pro poor tourism and heritage conservation in India, uh, solar pumping for rainwater harvesting and, in, and building use here in Delhi again. And then finally, the uh, lake and pond restoration, which took a highly polluted pond and converted it uh, with some reed bed uh, wastewater treatment plants, but ran into all kinds of interesting challenges with respect to uh, the public trust doctrine, which emanates from Chicago, one of our key cases uh, and regions maybe we'll hear more about uh, this afternoon. 
This is what I wanted to share a uh, way of introduction to say we have this extraordinary topic. We have an array of different approaches and variables that will be in play in the three case study regions we have. The one idea, if you take it away from, uh, is the question of what can this field of water conserving design be in integrative ways, in ways in which all of the different components of design and, and innovation start to be drawn together in more, I'll call it, um, ways that uh, have multiple interlinked and ultimately uh, highly coherent types of design approaches and philosophies that help might help guide uh, future work in this field. That's what I wanted to share today and uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks very much.